Uh, so this morning we're going to be talking about Scientology. Uh, before we do that, uh, we'll have a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, uh, we thank You so much for the opportunity we have to come together this morning and to uh, study together and to worship together and to consider You together with one mind and one accord. We pray, Father, that You will... Uh, that you will bless us and strengthen us and that you will help us as we study together that you know, to come up with constructive and uh, well thought out ways of interacting with the lost and bringing them to you. Help us, Father, to uh, always strive to win others for Christ. Help us to be truthful and to be honest and to never waver from what is right. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, Mark is not here this morning. He's guest speaking in Brandon. And once again, uh, I've been called on to sub up for a class. Uh, and this was interesting for me. I'd never really looked at Scientology before. And uh, now that I have, it's kind of like... Uh, I think we're... I, I think Scientology probably pushes the boundaries a little bit on what we can call a religion. So at this point, we're, this is going to be the last thing the book covers. Um... Now, last week, Mark covered Christian science, which has nothing to do with Scientology at all. Uh, They're not related in any way. So don't confuse Scientology with Christian science. Uh, although they did have one thing in common, uh, they both can be the subject of the conversation between Mark and myself of which one of us has to teach the weirder religion. So uh, there's that, I guess. Uh, but Scientology is also incredibly controversial. It's received a lot of substantial public opposition. Joe was just telling me before class starts uh, that apparently the Tampa Bay Times has been engaged in a long feud with the Church of Scientology. So, uh, you know, um, Well, you can after we go over some of the history, you can evaluate for yourself uh, what, whether this is something that you think is justified. Scientology started during the 20th century, so it's fairly new. It was started by a man named L. Ron Hubbard. And you can't really talk about Scientology without talking about L. Ron Hubbard. He was born in 1911 and died in 1986. So technically before I was born, he was dead. He was an only child. He was also a U.S. Navy officer. He attended George Washington University, but eventually he got placed on probation and didn't go back. Um... In 1938, he had this dental procedure and he reacted to a drug they gave him for it. And from that reaction, he claims that he received a revelatory near-death experience, uh, which he composed a manus He claims to have composed a manuscript based on this, which was later the inspiration for all of his later writings. Um, although we've never seen this unpublished manuscript, and uh, you know, some of this may have been his revising history after the fact, we don't know. Uh, the manuscript was called Excalibur. Uh, he fought in World War II, kind of. Uh, he was a lieutenant on a sub chaser and ordered his crew to fire depth charges on a Japanese sub. Uh, well, of course, they never found the sub and they never confirmed that there was one even in the area. But he, you know, he still takes credit in his lectures for sinking a Japanese sub. Uh, so, you know, I guess there's a controversy. And this is a con. This is a constant theme with L. Ron Hubbard is uh, differing radically from the, uh, the official account of things and saying, well, no, that's just a big conspiracy designed to discredit me. Uh, everything is a cons according to L. Ron Hubbard, everything is a conspiracy designed to discredit him. And according to Scientologists, everything is a conspiracy designed to discredit Scientology. So just keep that in mind. You know, that if you start go out swinging, attacking them, you know, well... Well, you've just bought into the, the big conspiracy, the lie, the, the tri to trick you into hating Scientology. And even just by teaching this class, I guess I bought into it too, so uh, there you go. But uh, eventually Hubbard was removed from command when he ordered his crew to fire on the Coronado Islands because apparently they belonged to our ally Mexico and that was bad uh, to shoot at them. Uh, then he became ill from stomach pains in 1945 and spent m the remainder of the war in the hospital. After the war... In August of 1945, he moved into the mansion of a man named Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was an occultist and a thelemite. Uh, anybody here ever heard of what a, a thelemites? Neither have I. But neither had I until I was researching this. 
Uh, but Thelemites, Thelema is a, another religion. Uh, it was invented by Aleister Crowley, a ceremonial magician and prophet of the New Age. So-called prophet of the New Age. And uh, Thelema believes in a number of gods. It's a polytheistic religion. Uh, but you know, it includes things like Nuit and Hadit and Rahur Kuit and other... I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciations. Uh, but one of the chief female goddesses in Thelemites was a goddess named Babylon. Not Babylon like we see in the Bible, uh, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N, but rather it's spelled with an extra A, B-A-B-A-L-O-N. Uh, just you know, minor tweak, but it, you know, they worship a goddess called Babylon. And so while Hubbard and Parsons were living together in 1946, they engaged in a series of magical rituals in an effort to summon the goddess Babylon... Uh, the rituals were called Babylon Working. And after the first round of rituals, Parsons met a woman named Marjorie Cameron, who he claimed was the elemental that they had summoned. And then they uh, set to work to conceive a child through what he called sex magic. And uh, so... Uh, these are all true stories. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. Uh, Hubbard, of course, uh, he was a participant in all of these things. Uh, Hubbard also, while he was living with Jack Parsons, managed to steal his girlfriend of 21 years. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Hubbard, eventually in 1947, Hubbard requested psychiatric treatment. Uh, And so he was seeking out psychiatric treatment, but he was unable to afford it. And eventually they diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia and recommended that he be committed. And at that point... L. Ron Hubbard decided that the entire psychiatric profession was evil. And uh, so that becomes kind of a major theme in Scientology. Psychiatry is evil. Uh, and it's dangerous. And then, of course, another thing that Hubbard was doing, he, was, he began late in the 1940s, he began working as a hypnotist. This guy's done everything. Uh, he, he began working as a hypnotist, and he posed as a... He was uh, working as a swami in Hollywood... And as a hypnotist, he began to create something called Dianetics. Anybody know what Dianetics is? Anybody ever heard of that? You've heard of it? Yeah, well, Dianetics. Uh, And, you know, figure out what Dianetics is. I just watched watched one of their recruitment videos, and they explain what Dianetics is. It's basically, Dianetics is this idea about your mind and about your body and about how they relate together. And it basically works like this, okay? Every experience that you have in life, everything you touch, everything you smell, everything good or bad that happens to you is recorded in your mind. It's just kind of like a video or whatnot. And, you know, these, these, all these memories get recorded in your mind, but you actually have two parts to your mind. Three parts, actually. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to say two, because those are the only two that are relevant for this discussion. You have your analytical mind. That's the part that makes all your decisions and is rational and is smart. You know, that's the part you use when you think about stuff. But then you have another part of your mind called the reactive mind. And whenever you use your reactive mind, it's like, you know, you see a spider. Oh, you know, you react to it, you know. The reason you react to it is there's no reason, there's no rational reason to be afraid of spiders. They're a million times you know, smaller than you are. But you're still afraid of spiders because of bad things that happened in your past. Whenever you have a bad memory or a traumatic experience, that gets recorded in your reactive mind. That bad memory, they have a technical term for it. It's called an engram. Okay? All of your, most of your experiences are in your analytical mind, but your bad experiences, your traumatic engrams, are stored in your reactive mind, which was previously unknown. Dianetics is a psychiatric process to erase the contents of the reactive mind so that you stop being afraid of spiders and stop acting irrationally and, start, and stop yelling at those guys you see in traffic all the time. And start doing things rationally, clearly, um, you know, every, and so that there's just that kind of idea. But, and then they say, you know, these engrams go back before you can even really think and remember. Some of your bad experiences happened when you were a baby. Some of your bad experiences happened when you were in the womb, before you were bur- born. You know, maybe your mother bumped into something when she was pregnant with you and hurt you. Some of your bad experiences may even go back to before you existed, when you existed in another form, because uh, there's uh, there's kind of a there's kind of a reincarnation element in Scientology, which we'll, we'll get. It. Um, anyhow, to quote their recruitment video, what would life be like if all of the pain you've experienced no longer affected your abilities, emotions, and behaviors? 
you would think and behave rationally, making the best possible decisions relating to your survival. You would be able to utilize your imagination and creativity to the fullest. You would be confident, more intelligent and productive and happier. You would be yourself, free to enjoy life and reach your full potential. In short, your mind would be clear. That is the goal of Dianetics. People achieve this state every day, and so can you. Now, and that's a word they use a lot, clear. You know, clear is the state you achieve when you start getting these engrams out of your mind. Uh, And of course, there's greater and greater and greater levels of clear. Uh, But the procedure of erasing the reactive mind and getting rid of your engrams is a process called auditing. Not something you do with your taxes, but something you do with your memories here. Auditing. Uh, So anyhow, this is, and we'll talk more about auditing in a minute. And if anybody has any questions or, you know, I may not be able to answer them because I'm still kind of giving introductory knowledge of this, but uh, by all means ask away and we'll see what happens. So Hubbard published a lot of books in the 1950s. Uh, He published his book on Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. Uh, He had a work called Dianetics, The Evolution of a Science, uh, which he published in a pulp magazine called Outstanding Science Fiction. And that wasn't a misstatement there. It really was called Outstanding Science Fiction uh, because uh, that should give you an idea of the theme of where we're going. Uh, He published a Scientology, A History of Man in 1952, which he called a cold-blooded and factual account of your last 60 trillion years. Uh, One thing that's interesting about Scientology is that, you know, most religions claim that the Earth is... uh, Well, you know, you got... You know, the scientific consensus that the universe is like 13 billion years old. And then you've got, you know, a lot of religions that claim, well, no, it's younger than that. Um, like Christianity or Judaism or others. Or, and some people, you know, who are just ag- don't care about the age of the universe. And then you've got, but Scientology is one of the few religions that claims the universe is far older than the, than the so-called scientific consensus. They, they, they push it back to like 76 trillion years or something astronomical like that. Um, But more on what they think of the origins of us in a minute. Uh, Hubbard, everything I've said, does it sound like a religion to you? Dianetics? What does it sound like? Sounds like a crazy, (laughs) crazy way of life. It's, I mean, Hubbard, well, and here, now we'll Terminology, cult, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I mean, you know, with. Hmm? Well, you should. Oh. The, 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 the thing about cults and. This is, you know, there are uh, cults have to have a certain number, a measure of appeal to certain people, and I mean, there is a certain insider culture. There is a certain, you know, you feel really welcome when you join a cult. You feel really welcome and accepted. It's very hard to get someone out of that. Um, I mean, and before we, before we're quick to criticize folks for being gullible, we realize that you know, there's a lot of humans that are very capable of buying into cult mentalities if subjected to the to the right pressure points or the right influences. Uh, I mean, and you could see the appeal, even, of saying, well, you know, you can get all of these bad memories out of your mind and stop behaving irrationally and get rid of your trauma and achieve your potential. And some of the potentials that Scientology promises are things like, you know, freedom from, uh, you know, freedom from disease. And they talk about, uh, one of my favorite things that they promise is that eventually they will be able to use psychic telekinetic powers, which sounds really cool, doesn't it? And so, you know, those kinds of things... Those kinds of promises are one way that cults will hook people in. But everything I've described up to this point, though, isn't a religion at all. It's a form of psychotherapy is what it is, right? Dianetics is essentially just that. It's an attempt, it's, you know, I mean, it's not a very well accepted and not, it's considered incredibly eccentric, but it was a form of, Hubbard wasn't trying to start a religion. He was trying to promote a new form of psychotherapy. So where did the religion angle come from? Well, that's what... What happened was Dianetics wasn't accepted in the psychology community at all. Um, in the... Uh, Morris Fishbein, who was the editor at the time of the Journal of the American Medical Association, just outright dismissed his book and said, you know, we're not even going to cover it. 
uh, in Newsweek, a Newsweek article published in 1950, uh, it says that di- the Dianetics concept is unscientific and unworthy of discussion or review. And then in 1951, the New Jersey Board of Medical Examiners decided to take Hubbard's foundation to court in 1951 for teaching medicine without a license. And of course, they bankrupted him in the process of doing this. Uh, So Hubbard had a hard time convincing people that Dianetics was a legit form of psychology or psychotherapy or whatever it is. Uh, uh, He couldn't sell it as a science. So what did he do? We sell it as a religion. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, this kind of language, for instance, there's a letter he wrote in 1953, which uh, I have a sample up here. I await your reaction on the religion angle. The religion angle. In my opinion, we couldn't get worse public opinion than we have had or have less customers with what we've got to sell. A religious charter would be necessary in Pennsylvania or New Jersey to make it stick, but I'm sure I could make it. Well, but I sure could make it stick. Customers, selling. We gotta do the we gotta use the religion angle. We've already had bad luck with our customers before now, so we're gonna try the religion angle. You see what he's you see what he's kind of talking this is, right? This is a man who started a religion to make money off of something when he couldn't sell it in the, to the science community. He is a, well, he is a charlatan. There's no question about that. Huh? Why didn't he cure himself? What? Oh, well, he would claim he wasn't. there was nothing wrong with him to begin with. No. You know, that whole idea that Ron Hubbard's a, a, a paranoid schizophrenic, that's just part of the conspiracy to discredit him. No. Now, you see, they have an answer for everything on that point. You know, there's, everything's part of the conspiracy to discredit him. All right, so in 1953, Hubbard started actually three different churches, uh, but they're basically all the same thing. And there's the Church of American Science, there's the Church of Spiritual Engineering, and the Church of Scientology, which is the name that we know it by. Uh, now the Church of Scientology has had no end of legal battles because they're constantly getting taken to court. For instance, in 1963, the FDA raided their offices, seizing the e-meters. I haven't talked about e-meters. Uh, e-meters are... They're, they're abbreviated e-meters constantly, but E stands for uh, the electropsychometer. It's the electropsychometer. It's a device that's used in the process of auditing to measure the electrical currents that are passing through your body as uh, you go through. I, I don't really fully understand how it works, to be honest. But anyhow, they were using these electropsychometers in auditing. And, you know, I, I should have I should have brought a picture of one because you can get them online. Well, anyhow, uh, the FDA seized a bunch of them, took them to court, tried to get the e-meter banned because... I mean, you know there's a problem when you're using a device called an electropsychometer. That sounds like something straight out of a science fiction movie. Um, the FDA did not succeed in getting the e-meter banned, however. But they did, and this is, this is the good part, they did, uh, now, as a result of the court ruling, Scientologists are now required by law to label the e-meters with a statement to the effect of, uh, this device doesn't really do anything, it's only a religious artifact. Uh, they are now required by law to label the device that way, even though they continue to use it in their auditing sessions. Uh, now, there's there's also been a lot of battles about whether or not they deserve tax-exempt status, and this is the constant back and forth of whether or not they count as a religion. Uh, in 1967, the IRS ruled that it's a commercial enterprise. It's not a religion. They have to pay taxes. Right? Well, the Church of Scientology didn't like that ruling very much. So, you know, they've, been, they've fought that ruling constantly. Eventually what happened is they started sending out surveillance to spy on key members of the IRS and, you know, figure out secrets about their private life that would embarrass them and bring them into public exposure in an effort to get the decision changed. And so, eventually, in 1993, the IRS agreed. Scientology is a religion. They are now tax exempt. Uh, so there you go. That's re- that. That's one consequence of religious freedom. You know, you can fight for the side of religious freedom, but it does mean you have to count some of these kinds of crazy things uh, as religions. Um, now, the Church of Scientology is worth, as of 2015, over $1.2 billion. And although, to be fair, the Catholic Church is actually worth way, way, way more money. And so, uh, you know, they're not the richest religion in the world. Uh, and the Catholic Church is just as much of a con game, I guess, in some ways. But numerous celebrity 
There's also a lot of famous people that are Scientologists. Uh, so, you know, if you ever see Tom Cruise or John Travolta or folks like that... Uh, In fact, I didn't even draw this connection until last night. But there is a John Travolta movie called Phenomenon, which I thought was an interesting movie, I guess. It was uh, in which he has some revelatory experience, and then throughout the course of the movie he becomes super smart, and he gains psychic telekinetic powers, and then it turns out the whole thing was caused by a brain tumor. But I don't know if that part was scientological, but... Uh, but it was interesting that that, mo- that psychic telekinesis was a theme in that movie. Um, anybody ever seen that movie? Even that's just a okay. So it was yeah, it's old. I, I saw it on TV once, you know. So um, okay. So anyhow, there's a lot of celebrity members like Tom Cruise and John Travolta. Uh, the U.S. has been kinder to Scientology than other nations. Germany just outright refuses to recognize it as a religion. France, cons- uh, the government calls it a dangerous cult in France, and they charge some of its leaders with fraud. So, I mean, you know, Scientology is not very well liked around the world because there's a conspiracy. Um, now, L. Ron Hubbard himself, you know talk quite a bit about what a bad person he is. Uh, he was married to a woman... He's been married a few times. Uh, his first wife was a woman named Polly. Uh, her real name was Margaret, but she went by Polly from 1933 to 1947. Uh, and you'll notice that that overlaps a little bit with the time he was at, at war and the time he was living with Jack Parsons. Uh, there, the marriage was strained a little bit. Well, it was strained for a while because Hubbard... They lived in Washington State. But Hubbard spent a lot of time in New York. And in the process of living in New York, he acquired several mistresses. Well, his wife found out about this because she found letters in the mailbox that Hubbard was writing to his mistresses. There were several of them to several different women. Uh, His wife's response was to switch the letters around, open the envelopes and switch the letters. Uh, So you can imagine what the effect and the result of that would have been. Eventually, Hubbard moved in with the occultist John Parsons and uh, started having an affair with Parsons' girlfriend, Sarah. And Polly did not see Hubbard at all between 1945 and 1947. They were married up to 1947. In 1946, Hubbard married Sarah. And that's not a mistake. Uh, that, well, that typo is not a mistake. The marriage was a mistake. But, uh, but you know, so since he was technically married to Polly, that meant he was practicing bigamy without her knowledge. Um, she didn't find out until after she filed for divorce because it's like, where is Ron? He hasn't paid. He hasn't paid for my kids in years. You know, she's filing for divorce, and then she finds out he's gotten remarried to somebody else already before this ever happened. Um, there was a divorce terms to pay twenty five dollars a month per child, which he did not do, despite getting rich off of diagnetics. And then Polly had to sue him in, in nineteen fifty one for that. Nineteen fifty one, the second wife, Sarah, filed for divorce because. And the court documents from the divorce proceedings claim that uh, he kept her sleep deprived, he tried to strangle her, he performed scientific torture experiments, he ran over her with his car, he tried to persuade her to commit suicide to avoid the divorce proceedings. Um, At one point he kidnapped their daughter and took her to Cuba and then uh, called Sarah and said he had killed her even though he hadn't because this is all part of his sadistic way of thinking. Um... So you can judge for yourselves what kind of a person L. Ron Hubbard was. Um, anyhow, uh, so Sarah divorced him, and then he married a third woman named Mary Sue. But what I thought was interesting is, you know, the way that Hubbard denies all of this is, you know, in uh, in an interview later on, he says, "How many times have I been married? I've been married twice." And I'm very happily married just now. I have a lovely wife. I have four children. My first wife is dead. Now, of course, he was actually married three times and he had seven children. So the interviewer naturally asked, well, what happened to your second wife? And Hubbard said, I never had a second wife. He's been married twice, but he never had a second wife. Just keep that in mind. I don't... I count... I I guess I count differently than he does. Uh, Okay, well, that's... Hubbard, anyway, uh, we'll talk about some of the beliefs and practices. Uh, we already talked about auditing and Dianetics. One of Scientology's symbols is this uh, eight point, eight-pointed cross symbol that you find in your books. Uh, and the eight points represent the eight dynamics, which are... Uh, it's all about survival. Uh, humans have an urge towards survival through their eight different things, eight different dynamics. And they are, in order, the ur- one, the urge towards survival of self, Two, the urge towards survival through sex. 
Three, the urge towards survival through a group, like a school or a club or team. Four, the urge towards survival through all mankind. Five, the urge towards survival through life forms like animals, birds, and fish. Six, the urge towards survival through the physical universe, uh, which the physical universe is composed of matter, energy, space, and time. Nest, for short. Uh, uh, seven, the urge towards survival through spirits or a spirit. And eight, the urge towards survival through the supreme being. Um, now, the, as far as the supreme being goes, uh, the concept of God is the eighth dynamic. Do Scientologists believe in a God of some kind? Of some kind. Yeah. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote that no culture in the history of the world, save the thoroughly depraved and expiring ones, has failed to affirm the existence of a supreme being. It is an empirical observation that men without a strong and lasting faith in a supreme being are less capable, less ethical, and less valuable to themselves and society. A man without an abiding faith is, by observation alone, more of a thing than a man. So, you know. But the concept of God is fairly vague, and they are encouraged to define God in their own way. There's not really a set dogma about God. Um, they don't believe uh, that G. Well, I mean, Hubbard said that Jesus isn't the great spiritual, per- great the great moral teacher or the great spiritual teacher that he was cracked up to be. So, uh, they don't think much of Jesus. Um, now, Scientology claims that its beliefs and its practices are based on rigorous research, and so if the Church of Scientology says it, that means it is a scientific law. It's the science in the name Scientology. Thetans. Anybody know what a thetan is? Uh-oh. Oh, let's talk about yeah. You have to you have to talk about thetans when you talk about Scientology. Uh, the thetan, that's T H E T A N. The thetan is the immortal soul. It is the true identity of the person. The human body is really just a meat shell for the thetan. Uh, and according to Scientology, the thetan is intrinsically good and it's omniscient and it has all kinds of superpowers. Um, but the Thetans ruined everything by bringing the material universe into existence and then now the universe exists because the Thetans agree that it exists and at some point the Thetans lost their memory of their true spiritual nature and they got plagued with all of these engrams and now they lost all their powers and now they're just trapped in these bodies and they're reborn over and over and over in these, pro- in these physical bodies through a process called assumption which is really just another word for reincarnation. They don't say reincarnation, they say assumption but... Um, well, it's hard to get a, a clear answer of what the difference is between assumption and reincarnation. Anyhow, Thetans, uh, you know, and this is the reason why you're not capable of psychic telekinetic powers because you have all these bad traumatic memories that are plaguing you. You have to get clear and become an operating Thetan before you can be freed of all this stuff. The Dianetic Auditor will... Um, you know, will help you in this process. He'll ask questions, uh, locate painful experiences in your past, and uh, I mean, really, I mean, in practice, auditing is more like well, has been described as similar to a confessional or a pastoral counseling session. Uh, although there's no forgiveness dispensed because that's not how it works. Um, and uh, they, you know, they do all kinds of other things too. If you want to join Scientology, anyone interested in doing that? <laughs> if you want to join Scientology, you go through something called the Purification Rundown, which basically you have to detoxify yourself. Uh, and it's their introductory service, which uh, detoxification involves taking high-dose diet supplements and spending five hours a day in a sauna, um, which that's the only way to deal with drug abuse or toxic exposure, according to the Church of Scientology. Uh, there's a lot of other practices. Um, they don't believe in They don't believe in psychology or psychiatry, which... I mean, to be fair, psychiatry says things that are kind of out there sometimes. Uh, but the problem is, of course, the L. Ron Hubbard's reasoning is, you know, since they told him you have to be committed and treated for paranoid schizophrenia, that naturally made him a little paranoid about the psychiatric profession for some reason. Uh, they rejected Ron Hubbard's theories, so he rejected them. Like, fine, you don't accept my theories, I don't accept you. That was a very mature way to handle that situation. Um, as you eliminate your engrams, you achieve clear. Uh, but the more clear you become, the greater and greater your level of operating Thetan. Uh, so they have a hierarchy in Scientology. You can be operating Thetan level 1, you can be operating Thetan level 2, 
uh, and there's all these different things. And, and the operating Thetan is able to control or operate thought, life, matter, energy, space, or time, with or without a body. It doesn't mean that one becomes God. It means one becomes wholly oneself, to quote their website. Okay, now, so how do you achieve these great states? Well, anybody want to take a guess how you achieve these greater and greater states of clear to become an operating Thetan? You want to guess what the magic key is? Hmm? Money? What? Yes, that's the right answer. To become an operating Thetan, level one, you, uh, that is the first step towards the fresh OT viewpoint of the messed universe. Operating Thetan is sometimes abbreviated OT, short. Uh, and, it will, and it can be yours for the low price of $2,750. I mean, uh, that's more than our monthly budget, so... Uh, Operating Thetan Level 2 comes with a resurgence of self-determinism and native ability, achieving the ability to confront the whole track. And it can be yours for the low cost of $5,225. And granted, when I'm giving these prices, these prices are always fluctuating. So, uh, you know, if somebody's watching this recording, you know, a year later and these numbers have changed, don't blame me. Uh, You know, Operating Thetan Level 3... The wall of fire. You overcome the obstacles that prevent a being from becoming himself. OT3 is a dangerous process you know, because it can lead to things like pneumonia and sleep deprivation or death if not done right. Um, and it costs you $8,910. Really escalating this. Um, after you get to OT level 3, you get access to some of the secret teachings. Every, every every OT level, you get access to a little bit more of the secret teachings that they don't want the public to know about. Which is funny, because the public knows about all of them, because they're on the internet. Uh, but, you know, an OT, this wasn't known for a while. But when you get to OT level 3, you get the, Hubbard's handwritten notes about Xenu. Xenu was an ancient being who was the dictator of the Galactic Confederacy. And he brought billions of life forms to Earth to slaughter them with hydrogen bombs. And the spirits of these life forms became the Thetans that inhabit us. And this was when Mark and I were arguing about which one of us had the weirder religion to cover. I told him about Xenu and about that story. Uh, again, you can judge for yourselves uh, which one <laughs> wins. But um, okay, yeah. And then OT level four, you get the drug rundown, uh, which handles the problems caused by drugs and poisons. OT level five, you get the new era dianetics. There's OT level six and seven, and. Uh, OT level 7 is the level that Tom Cruise was at as of 2015. And OT level 8, that's the highest level currently available. Operating Thetan level 8 is called Truth Revealed. And at this level, you get access to the document that Hubbard wrote for circulation after his death. No one is allowed to know what this document says unless they're in OT level 8. It says... Well, thank you, Internet. I'll just say that. Uh... In this document, Hubbard claimed that the historic Jesus was not nearly the sainted figure he has been made out to be. In addition to being a lover of young boy sand men, of young boys and men, uh, there's a typo there, uh, he was given to uncontrollable bursts of temper and hatred. So he said some not nice things about Jesus. Hubbard further had comments about the book of Revelation. He said, no doubt you are familiar with the Revelations section of the Bible. Love how I called it Revelations, S. Where various events are predicted. Also mentioned is a brief period of time in which an arch enemy of Christ, referred to as the Antichrist, will reign, and his opinions will have sway. All this makes for very fantastic, entertaining reading, but there's truth in it. This Antichrist represents the forces of Lucifer, literally the light bearers or light bringer. Lucifer being a mythical representation of the forces of enlightenment, the galactic confederacy. My mission could be said to fulfill the biblical promise represented by this brief Antichrist period. During this period, there is a fleeting opportunity for the whole scenario to be effectively derailed, which would make it impossible for the mass Maccabean landing, the second coming, to take place. In other words, Popper basically claims he's the Antichrist. Uh, He said it, not me. Uh, There's also a bunch of unreleased levels. You know, operating Thetans levels 9, 10, 11, on and on we go. Uh, when you get to level 16, there's psychic telekinesis Thetan unleashed, which is possible. But again, uh, operating Thetan level 18 is supreme being, just to you know get that up. So that, that's probably where you're headed. But these levels are unreleased because we're not ready for them yet. Uh, you can't 
And, and, and so this is, the unreleased levels will be released when the members have done enough to deserve it. Which, you can guess what doing enough to deserve it means. Oh, send us more money. <laughs> okay, so... But here's the thing about these operating Thetan levels. You cannot learn all of Scientology's teachings unless you can get into the higher levels of initiation because they claim that these mystical teachings might be harmful to unprepared learners. In fact, most people who joined Scientology didn't know about Xenu when they joined. But now, thanks to the internet, everybody knows about Xenu. Uh, this has not stopped Scientologists from trying to sweep Xenu under the rug because you cannot understand Xenu unless you are an OT3. And if you learn about him too quickly, you might die. So... So, uh, and I mean, you know, the extent to which this happens is interesting. There was a televised interview. I was watching the video of this, and the Scientologist was being interviewed, and the interviewer asked him about Xenu, and his response was to unplug his microphone and walk off of the set. Didn't even, won't even address the question. In 1997, when Scientologists were being taken to court, because that happens a lot, um, a judge mentioned Xenu in the ruling. And so the Scientology lawyers just started swooping down on this thing, trying to get the record sealed. Because can't have people knowing about Xenu. be bad. You can't understand Xenu except after years of study. So that's why it's kept secret, even though it's public knowledge. Um, now, to finally, and uh, we again, this is the session where we talk more about the history and the beliefs. And Mark will have more to say, I guess, on how to talk to them. But... But one thing I'd say that you have to know when you meet, if you meet a Scientologist, you talk to a Scientologist, they believe in a practice called disconnecting. You know what disconnecting is. All right, dis- most religions, if you attack their faith, you know, they'll try at least a little bit to defend what they believe. They might even try to convert you. But Scientologists don't do that. Scientologists believe in something called disconnecting. If you are, if you are someone who is, they view as suppressive to the faith, then you're cut off. You're not allowed in their life. They won't converse with you. They won't, they'll cut that person out of their life entirely. You are an obstacle to them reaching clear status. If you say negative things about Scientology, if you are suppressive of Scientology, then they disconnect from you. And they will do it even if you are a close family member. If you are viewed as suppressive, they will disconnect. And just to clarify... Oh no, that, that's, that fits with what I'm saying here. Disconnecting means they cut you out of your life if they think you're suppressive to Scientology. Yeah. I mean, no, we'll get, we'll, get to, we'll get to this in a moment. Okay. Scientologists will disconnect from anybody. If your close family members are suppressive to Scientology? No. And what does somebody have to do to be suppressive? A suppressive person is anyone who criticizes Scientology or anybody who takes legal action against Scientology, or anybody who even associates with people who, who do those things. Which means that just by teaching this class, I am suppressive. And just by being in this class, you are suppressive. And if you don't adhere to the rules of disconnecting, you might be sent to the whole. Now, of course, a Scientologist will deny that the whole exists. Um, but the Tampa Bay Times has quite a bit to say about the whole. Uh, so there you go. The 2013 Tampa Bay Times article describes the whole as a place where executives are sometimes sent for disciplinary action. Quote, It becomes a place of confinement and humiliation where Scientology's management culture, always demanding, grew extreme. Inside, a who's who of Scientology leadership went at each other with brutal tongue lashings and hands and fists. They intimidated each other into crawling on their knees and standing in trash cans and confessing to things they hadn't done. They lived in degrading conditions, eating and sleeping in cramped spaces designed for office use. Um, Now, the Church of Scientology denies that such a place exists, but former Scientologists will compare it to a concentration camp. Uh, and testified in court that there were bars on the windows, security guards at the doors, the food was barely edible, the trailer infested with ants, and they were present, pressured to confess their misdeeds, quote-unquote. Uh, you know, you've got to be reconditioned for them because that's the nature of Scientology. Um, it's a pretty all-consuming thing. 
uh, read one article by someone who left Scientology says that all of, almost all of my friends were Scientologists. Almost all of my money went to Scientology. Up to 20 hours a week were spent at the church studying or getting counseling. Even when I had a full-time job, my whole life centered around Scientology and I wasn't even a staff member. For a staff member, it becomes all-consuming. All right, so... I mean, when you're talking to Scientologists, and I think this will be the key to kind of, you know, evaluating this and uh, understanding this, is that, you know, it, if you're going to have any progress in the conversation, you've got to figure out a way to have the conversation without them disconnecting from you. You know, and which is why all of the stuff I've said here is stuff you need to be aware of, but it's not the first, it's not the guns you bring out against them. Because... You know, I mean, if you come out guns blazing, talking about Xenu, they're going to disconnect. If you say it's not a religion, the moment you say it's not a religion, it's a cult, they will disconnect. The moment, the moment you insult L. Ron Hubbard, they will disconnect. You're part of the conspiracy against them. You know, uh, I mean, this gets to something that's really just kind of fundamental. If when you're trying to get somebody out of a cult. You know, as, as with anything, listen, ask questions. We've talked about this in other religions. And when it comes to cult situations, it's extremely important that you care. Because the thing that hooks people into cults isn't logic and reason. It's, you know, this emotional connection that they form with their cult members. And when people are, I mean, people are in cults are strongly discouraged from having any friends or any connections with anybody that's outside. Which means that if somebody decides to leave Scientology because of something you said, you will literally be their only friend in the entire world. You better care about them. They better believe they can trust you. That's the thing that we need to get. And there's probably more to say, but you know, a lot of listening... I mean, inside they know something's wrong. That's the thing. You've got to get them to come to that realization and confront it. And, I mean, you ask questions, ask them questions, you know, that they really just work on asking questions they can't answer. Don't be mean about it. Don't be adversarial. Be nice. But you have to ask them questions they can't answer. And that'll eat them up on the inside. And when they decide to leave, if they decide to leave, you will be their only friend in the world. Make sure that you do the right thing. Well, we're out of time. So, uh, we will... Uh, Mark will hopefully have more to say... Uh, next Thursday when he comes back and then um, I'll go ahead and we'll conclude the Bible class for now.